knows we are going to record this. So we've started the recording. So I'll start that again. Welcome everyone uh, to the second session, Severe and Extreme Convector Storms. Uh, we've got some really good talks lined up this afternoon. So I'll try my best to keep everybody on schedule. I'll give you a two minute warning, uh, should need be. And uh, the first talk up this afternoon is Arnold Ashton, S-band dual polarization radar, evaluation of the Barry Ontario tomato of July 15th, 2021. So uh, please share your screen, Arnold, and we'll get going. All right, how does that look? Can everyone hear me and see the screen okay? Yes. Beautiful, all right. Um, thank you, Julian. Welcome everyone, good day. And uh, this is a talk about the Barry tornado from last summer. Uh, Daniel Leota, my co-presenter and I will be primarily discussing the S-band radar analysis of this storm. So it was certainly an impactful storm. It was one of 10 tornadoes, actually. The Barry tornado was rated EF2 by the Northern Tornado Project. And uh, as you can see, significant damage, thankfully no fatalities, although there were 11 injuries. And just for glance value, this, um, this slide here is basically indicating that we, we did have um, this kind of an overview of the parameter space and the synoptic pattern. So we're basically this star represents the buried tornado. And you can see we're kind of in the, the right exit of this strong upper level jet. And the upper panel basically indicates uh, the location of the 10 tornadoes with the red dot indicating um, the buried tornado. All the tornadoes occurred south, e south and east of the surface low. Looking at all the other parameters, of course, the bulk shear, the cape, um, and all the low level magic associated with tornadoes with uh, helicity were certainly there. It, was, it wasn't what you would call a gangbuster kind of event, but everything was kind of lock and step with uh, a fairly significant tornadic outbreak. If we look at uh, some sounding data, this is a proximity sounding roughly half an hour prior to tornado genesis where the ML cape was approaching 2000 joules per kilogram and we had a significant bulk shear in the 45 to 50 knot range and certainly in the upper right, uh, you can see the uh, typical sickle or hockey stick shape um, photograph here indicating high helicity values. Jumping right into radar here, the top panel, the top row is essentially reflectivity where you can actually see a cell merger. T0 would be the time of tornado touchdown. So at T minus 13 there in the first frame, you can sort of see a cell to the south. It merges with the uh, northern cell over Barry um, just prior to tornado touchdown to the west of Highway 400. And certainly the velocity scans are indicating a tightening couplet as well. It's maybe more dramatic even with uh, in, in storm relative velocity sense. And these are all from the S-Ban radar, which is newly minted uh, from King City uh, just weeks prior to this outbreak. Notice the tightening couplet, so it was pretty, pretty impressive. Now this is a, a, a wonderful spreadsheet. Dan put this together and it's based on the Thompson et al. paper from 2017. And it basically is a VROC calculator. So it's lo lo looking at rotational velocity. It's an editable Excel spreadsheet uh, where you basically input your maximum inbound, outbound uh, velocities, circulation diameter, and with your beam height as well. You can either put in your plane velocity scans, or you can go into storm relative velocity as well, or you can tilt higher and get sort of a, a sense of what's happening. And it, it it's basically spits out based on a large sample size, your probability of a tornado here. So you can see how the tightening couplet ramped up this probability of tornado basically right at tornado touchdown time. So VROD of course is, is good, it's great, but it's a reactive, not, not a proactive tool. So we're gonna look at three other options today using S-Ban radar. First is the storm relative velocity enhancement in relation to the mesocyclone. 
Um, somewhat related to that is we're going to analyze ZDR arc disruptions, basically indicating the presence of any wet melting hail that might suggest that you have a, a sufficiently cold downdraft, which is unsupportive, of course, for tornado genesis. Finally, we'll tie the ZDR arc in with the KDP foot. And we're looking at like a separation vector between these two parameters uh, to potentially infer low level storm relative helicity, um, essentially streamwise versus crosswise vorticity, which might lead to tornado genesis. And we'll be evaluating all these parameters on both the Barry tornadic supercell, as well as the nearby Cookstown supercell. So let's launch into this. Uh, basically the survey or the storm relative velocity enhancement is kind of a north to south forward flank downdraft airstream. And it's, it's uh, the, I think the key is that it's, if it's not too cool or sufficiently buoyant, it will curve around the mesocyclone and be lofted as opposed to um, the case where you would see the survey. And these are seen on an S-band radar with the storm melt to velocity. Basically, if you're seeing it kind of anticyclonically come around uh, past the mesocyclone, um, it, it's, it's basically suggesting you're getting a null case in this scenario. So kind of related to this null case, we have to consider the presence of hail. So an interrupted ZDR arc is kind of the phrase that's used, and this is research that goes back many years as well. Presence of wet melting hail would suggest negatively buoyant air, which is unfavorable for tornado genesis. And you're looking at uh, various S-band uh, tools here. So tumbling hail uh, generally indicates, uh, is indicated by a lower ZDR. Uh, it, and you wanna co-locate that with high reflectivities and a reduction in your correlation coefficient. Finally, we're gonna be looking at uh, size sorting. And in essence, and this goes back 10, 15, years as well. Um, we're looking at the potential for helicity ingestation into a supercell. And this graphic on the right kind of indicates what happens here with a strongly varying supercell where the large drops fall much quicker than smaller drops and basically fall on the southern flank of your forward flank downdraft. Whereas the majority of smaller drops uh, basically are, are, are lofted and a little further north. And so you get this separation between the two and you can actually kind of look at a centroid here uh, in the lower left and we see kind of a depiction of what the ZDR arc would look like in orange versus the KDP foot in blue. So what we're doing is we're looking at these uh, centroids and uh, we realize there it's a subjective analysis, but the upshot is that if there's pretty much a lower orientation angle between these two in relation to the storm motion, you're looking at more crosswise vorticity versus closer to a 90 degree angle, you're, you're increasing your potential for streamwise vorticity and ramping up the potential for tornado genesis. So with that, I will pass the uh, baton to Dan Leota, who will discuss this case. All right, so let's apply some of these techniques to the radar for the Barry case. So we'll start T minus 17 minutes to tornado time. And we could see just generally broad, uh, rather diffuse rotation at this time. At this time as well, we have a cell merger uh, with a previous non-tornadic supercell that's ongoing. So given the chaotic hydrometeor distribution here, uh, as a result of the merger, the outline of the ZDR arc was expanded to look more like the broader ZDR shield here until it became uh, better refined. So the small separation vector angle here, that is the angle between the KDP ZDR centroid separation vector and the storm motion vector infers the ingestion of crosswise dominant vorticity and generally lesser SRH. So if we go forward six minutes to the next scan, the ZDR arc becomes oriented along the forward flank and now begins to wrap into the hook region of what is a developing low level meso. The separation vector angle has now become considerably larger and infers that the storm is beginning to ingest larger values of SRH. This is another nod to the likely intensification of the low level meso. The velocity, we have a forward flank momentum surge 
Uh, it's gotten stronger with a clear reduction of inbounds in what appears like a convergent boundary. So given the radar viewing angle, it appears as if we are sampling that storm relative velocity enhancement or survey airstream. So you could also see the apparent turning as well. And what is that descending airstream? The turning of the airstream is key in the conversion of that crosswise to streamwise vorticity beneath the low level meso. And if we look up, in this case, around four to 5,000 feet AGL, we see uh, that there is a low level meso now evident and is situated nicely above the descending survey airstream. Six minutes later, uh, we see the ZDR arc even more preferentially oriented along the forward flank region, wrapping into the hook. Uh, the separation vector angle has become basically orthogonal at this point. So it's in storms ingesting high levels of SRH and pretty much purely streamwise vorticity. Uh, the forward flank momentum surge associated with the survey continues to be very strong uh, with that continued apparent turning as well. And if we look aloft at the uh, low level meso, we could still see, you know, although somewhat broad, uh, that low level meso remains situated above, nicely above that survey airstream. So if we go forward another six minutes, and at this point, the tornado is ongoing, the ZDRR continues to be oriented favorably, although a bit broader than that narrow textbook arc feature that we saw in the previous scans. There is a reduction in ZDR values between the forward flank and the hook. We're not sold that this is a ZDR arc disruption given the high CC values uh, that are not shown here. The hypothesis is that these ZDR values may be becoming influenced by precipitation that's being ingested into the inflow from the cell to the south. Uh, the separation vector angle is now about 120 degrees or so, although less favorable in terms of the ingestion of pure streamwise vorticity, it still infers a storm is ingesting a sizable amount of SRH. Uh, that forward flank momentum surge associated with the survey continues to be very strong with that turning. And if we go look at the low level meso now, again, by looking at that four to 5,000 uh, foot level, uh, we could see a nice, uh, tight, strong, low-level meso with a gate-to-gate -gate azimuthal shear signature. And there's that, an actual CC drop associated with uh, TDS in the next scan, although it's not shown in this presentation. So we'll briefly take you to another supercell that occurred just south of, of this uh, Barry storm shortly thereafter. This storm also had a ZDR present, although a bit broad along the forward flank. Uh, the small separation uh, vector angle as well inferred that there was an ingestion of largely crosswise dominant vorticity and lesser SRH with this storm. The forward flank momentum surge is also evident in this case, likely also apparent with the survey airstream, although with less turning, it's more of an elongated area of inbound velocity surging past the hook region of the storm as supported by the reflectivity fine line. So if we go forward one more scan, we could see that we have a, a very apparent hook here. Uh, the ZDR arc appears disrupted though with values near zero within the forward flank region of the storm. It's co-located with high reflectivity, KDP greater than a half degree per kilometer and low CC. So the hypothesis here Two is that it's an area of hydrometeor mix of rain and hail, which lends the idea of an overly, overly negative buoyant downdraft that would essentially negate tornado genesis. And if we look at that forward flank momentum surge associated with the survey, it appears to surge past the hook. Uh, there's a lack of scatters though, uh, which makes it hard to decipher in the, uh, as like for the outbounds, there's not many outbounds there. But if we do look at the mid uh, look up at around 3000 feet, uh, we can see that the low-level meso is situated notably poleward of that convergent area denoted by the survey in the lowest levels. And this fits well with the null case of the survey conceptual model. So to wrap everything all up, we know there's a lot to tornado genesis, uh, but the results here, leveraging these dual pole techniques are promising, at least for this particular case, uh, in improving tornado warning lead times, uh, potentially uh, enhancing forecaster confidence in the warning decision-making process, and even potentially in discriminating between tornadic and non-tornadic storms. So I'll leave it here. And if there's any questions, Arn and I will be happy to take them. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, that's really interesting. I do have one question here from Danny Brown. 
could the tornado probability spreadsheet be automated based on radar? Uh, well, that's a very good question. It's, uh, it, it's something we could leverage in the real time in the office. Of course, that, that is a issue with having enough staffing and so on. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's possible, I suppose. Um, yeah, I guess you're looking at, you're, you're talking about maybe getting algorithms to actually sort of make these calculations. So, um, but yeah, I maybe going forward is a possibility. It, it definitely can be done. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's relatively straightforward. Like those probabilities are just based off of uh, the paper from Rich Thompson. In, in Excel, it's essentially just a VLOOKUP table. So it's not any fancy calculation. Uh, but yeah, a lot, a lot of that stuff, it, it, it could be able with the appropriate expertise, IT can make that happen, I'm sure. So you mean they could be added to the skit table, for example? Uh, perhaps I, like it's every everything would be essentially like I mean internally within Nino every everything can be calculated like we're just doing this whole process manually, uh, which is straightforward but I mean it's a redundant task right. Right. Okay, great. There is another question from Dominique Grenet in the comments here, but I'll just invite you to speak, chat with him in the chat section. So keep going and keep on time. Uh, but thanks again. That was a really interesting okay. talk. Thank you. Thanks, so next up, we have Dave Sills from the NTP out of West University, and he's going to be speaking to our significant tornadoes occurring later in the year in southern Ontario. So Dave, take it away. Great, thanks. I'm just going to hide the controls here, and I think we should be good to go. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is, uh, let me just get rid of that. Uh, this is work that uh, has been published in a, a geophysical research letters paper, but I thought it would be good to uh, explain it here. And it's, my co-authors were, were, for this were uh, Connor Durfee, who was an intern uh, a couple years ago, and Dr. Camilla D'Souza at Western, who is uh, the stats whiz behind the, the project here. And I'll just try to get it to advance. Wake up. Hmm. There it wants to go now. Okay, just a little reminder about NTP. So it's a severe weather community endeavor, endeavor, but it was founded by Western and Impact WX back in 2017. Uh, the core team is composed of meteorologists and wind engineers. And so I'm the meteorologist uh, executive director and Greg Kopp is the, the uh, lead researcher and wind engineer. Uh, we also have an external research team that's focused on uh, innovations in detection, so a better way to detect tornadoes. Um, we have strategic partnerships with the University of Manitoba. You can see John Hanisak here. He's the, our partner at the U of M. Uh, the Weather Network, Instant Weather, Cat IQ, and we also close, uh, work closely with Environment Canada. So the idea with NTP is to advance knowledge of the true tornado occurrence in Canada and uh, risk across Canada. And what we're trying to do is detect, assess, document, and make public all Canadian tornadoes. And uh, we've done that for the last uh, three years across, across Canada. So starting in 2019, we started working across Canada and have been doing that since. And the reasons are for climatological purposes, risk assessment, climate change baselines, uh, that kind of thing. But another thing we're doing as part of NTP is generating long-term tornado data sets. So one of them is a new 30-year national climatology, and Francis will be talking about that in this session, and also uh, generating an Ontario database that goes all the way back to 1792, which is the first tornado in Canada. So uh, one, one thing that has been noted anecdotally in Ontario's severe weather community 
is that uh, tornadoes seem to be occurring later in the season than they used to, especially uh, especially our significant tornadoes. They used to be um, May events, and now we're getting into uh, October, or sorry, September, even yeah, even into October events um, with some of our tornadoes. So we wanted to look into this. Uh, there, were, there have been three November tornadoes on record in Ontario that have occurred since 2004. So all the EF1 tornadoes, 2005, 2013, 2020. Uh, in 2018, there was an EF3 tornado that was part of a seven tornado outbreak in Southern Ontario, neighboring Quebec. And that was in late September. Uh, it was the first September after EF3 uh, Canadian tornado in 120 years. And it was the first tornado outbreak of that kind of magnitude that late year in the year in Canada. Uh, so we needed a long-term data set to invest investigate if this uh, perception that tornado significant tornadoes are shifting to later in the year was correct. Uh, the Ontario data set is the longest tornado record in Canada and is particularly good for Southern Ontario. Um, while the first tornado, as I mentioned, is back in 1792, the first useful data for this study actually begins in 1875 when we start to get a bit more tornado per year. So just looking at the long-term trend for Ontario tornadoes from the, the data set. So this, this is a plot of all the tornadoes between 1875 and 2019. And what you'll note is a steady increase when you're looking at all tornadoes. But if you look at the long-term trend in significant tornadoes, so those are ones that are after EF2+, plus, uh, it really doesn't change a heck of a lot. There's no statistically significant long-term trend. And what the difference is, is there's a lot of uh, human artifacts in, in the, when you start including all of the data, including the weak tornadoes. So we're getting more and more weak tornadoes entering our database because of the prevalence of cell phone cameras, social media, more interest in severe weather, and so on. So with, when you're looking at the significant tornadoes, there's less human artifacts. So we want to use that data set, just the EF2 plus tornadoes, for the long-term study of the time of year to see if there is that shift. Uh, so just about the tornado data, we, as I said, we used uh, the EF2 plus tornadoes, uh, 1875 to 2019, and for Southern Ontario, so south of that dotted line there on the map, and assembled the same data for neighboring U.S. states of Michigan and New York State for comparison. Uh, where we got the American tornado data was from Grizzulis's significant tornadoes from 1875 to 1995. And from 1996 to 2019, we retrieved the data from the NOAA data portal. So methods uh, for all of these data sets, we used the recorded month of the tornado events to bin occurrences and to find the month with the maximum number of tornadoes each year, which we call the mode month. And uh, we used rolling 10-year periods to smooth short-term fluctu fluctuations and highlight longer-term trends. Uh, with the mode month over each 10-year period calculated at five-year intervals. And there were some ties, so we employed a tie-breaking procedure to handle when there were multiple mode months in that 10-year period that had the same number of tornadoes. Uh, the process data then were tested for autocorrelation. Uh, this is basically a check for independence of values at neighboring time intervals. And uh, assuming there wasn't autocorrelation, which was true, uh, we applied uh, the Spearman test through R, the R language to analyze the sign strength and statistical significance of any trend. So results uh, from Southern Ontario. So there's the graph of all of the mode months going from 1875 all the way to 2010. And applying the Spearman test indicated a weak positive correlation that was statistically significant at the 90% confidence level. So there was a trend, weakly positive, um, but we did notice that there was this kind of outlier near the beginning of the data set in 1890 with a September mode month that we thought probably was an outlier. And so we removed that and ran the test from 1895 to 2019. And that improved the results quite a bit. There was now a moderate positive correlation 
statistically significant at the 99% confidence interval. So definitely a trend towards uh, significant tornadoes occurring later in the year as you go from uh, 1895 to 2019. Now we also applied the same Spearman, Spearman's test to the Michigan data set, the New York data set, and the combined Michigan and New York data set for both the longer period and the shorter period. And there was no, st st no statistically significant trends. Uh, but you could see near the end here uh, that the, the Michigan data set does show a gradual increase in the mode month between 1970 and 2010. That al also influences the combined data set that's shown here. So there may be the start to a trend to later in the year going on in Michigan, but certainly not in New York State. Uh, the reason for the shift in Southern Ontario to later in the season is, is not clear. We haven't spent a lot of time looking at the reasons. Uh, the paper was mostly just to establish that there is a trend. Uh, but it's, it is odd, considering that there's no such shift that's apparent yet for the neighboring U.S. states. Uh, one possible reason is that uh, Great Lakes are warming. And that could have an influence, especially in the later summer when the lakes are still quite warm and the atmosphere is starting to cool. Uh, so that may extend uh, the tornado season a little bit in, um, in southern Ontario. Uh, but there is a limit to how far this peak tornado activity can shift toward the fall months. Obviously, you're not going to get tornado ingredients getting into uh, November and December very often, if at all. Um, and if there's periodicity to this shift, uh, it really couldn't be detected with the available data. We didn't see any period, periodicity uh, in the long record that we had. So regardless, uh, the later EF2 plus tornadoes in Southern Ontario are likely to have impacts. Uh, if you think about it, there's less people outdoors in the fall, so they're less likely to see the warning signs of a tornado. Kids are more likely to be con congregated in schools. Uh, earlier sunset times in the fall, so that means reduced visibility when there's evening tornadoes, and also the, just the general perception that tornadoes occur in summer, so people can be caught off guard uh, when, when you get a September or maybe an early October strong tornado, and that certainly was the case with the, uh, the Ottawa area tornadoes in 2018. And as I said, the full details are in the GRL paper uh, from 2022. And thanks. Oh, thanks, Dave. Wow. Yeah. Nice, short and sweet. Um, <laughs> I don't see any. I don't see any questions here. But um, this is be, probably beyond the scope of your paper. But did you look into why this might be happening? Well, like I said, the if if it was something like a teleconnection where you've got um, you know some kind of global influence happening, you certainly wouldn't expect. Southern Ontario to stick out uh, from its neighbors in Michigan and New York. So I, I think we can rule out global teleconnections in this kind of case. But uh, one thing that does happen is, as I said, the, the Great Lakes are warming. And if in, in a storm situation in the Great Lakes, you get a southwesterly flow ahead of a cold front a lot of the time. And if you look at that in terms of the geography of the area, uh, that southwest wind will blow over the warmer waters of the Great Lakes in southern Ontario, but not necessarily for the tornado prone regions of Michigan and New York State. Um, so that might be the reason that there's this difference between Ontario and its neighbors. Uh, just the, the way the, the lakes are arranged uh, around southern Ontario and, um, and the Great Lakes having that influence. And you know, as far as connection to climate change, the reason the Great Lakes are warming is climate change. So there, there may be an indirect connection to climate change through the warming of the Great Lakes here. Very, very interesting. So I don't see any more questions for you. So uh, we'll move on to the next talk in the session. And uh, as Dave mentioned, that's uh, Francis Levine Tellu. Um, on updating Canada's national tornado climatology. Francis is also from the NTP. So uh, Francis, take it away. All right, thanks Julian. Let me know if you can see it. Yeah, you're good. 
All right, hey everyone. Uh, so like Julian said, my name is Francis and I'm the bilingual research assistant for NTP. And I'm going, I'm going to go over our work um, updating Canada's national point of climatology. But first, uh, I'd like to acknowledge everybody at the NTP team uh, for helping me with data analysis and for ECCC for providing uh, some of the data for this project. So there's only two um, national Toronto database in Canada. So the 1950 to 1979 from New York, um, which is mainly anecdotal and generally left out Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And there's the 1980 to 2009 from uh, Sills and Al. So the database we worked on was 1991 to 2020. And we shifted it by one year uh, to match <clears throat> other 30 year uh, Canadian climatologies. So these databases are important um, to maintain climatological characteristics of hazards like tornadoes. Um, these are in turn used by researchers across the world, insurance companies for risk assessment, engineers uh, to develop better building codes, et cetera. So the objectives uh, were to obviously update Canada um, national tornado database up to 2020. So update also the existing 1980 to 2009 database uh, with newly found uh, satellite tornadoes and to essentially make the national tornado databases available in open source. Um, so the NTP online open access dashboard will allow you to essentially download the NTDs as well as you know NTP data moving forward. So for the methods, um, the 1980 to 2009 National Toronto Database uh, was downloaded from ECCC, and we amended it with NTP satellite Toronto's found by uh, Joanne, uh, which is soon to be published, and additional uh, other ad additional event revisions. So for the 2010 to 2018 data, um, ECCC provided us with storm reports. Uh, we also used newspaper clippings and other social media reports we were able to find. And for 2017, 2018 data was essentially a mix of NTP and ECCC data. And then for the 2019 to 2020 data was NTP only. So there's a lot of uh, QC quality checks involved uh, in the methods, a lot, a lot. So I just uh, listed a few here. Uh, just for just for fun, I guess. Uh, every single tornado, uh, basically in the databases, were every lat long, every start, worst end, uh, was important to GIS, and then triple check for possible errors. Uh, whenever there was a nearest town in the database, um, and and whenever the nearest town was 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 off from the lat longs, uh, we it was adjusted and changed to a more appropriate town uh, that reflected closer to start point. And then each damage indicator or DI was revisited uh, in relation to the reported damage. We tried to find video, photo, newspaper evidence to support each DI. Um, sometimes there was no evidence, so we had to change it. Uh, either, either either change the DI or change the rating. Uh, and some of them were changed to NI or no damage reported, um, which occurred you know a lot for F zeros and EF zeros. There was a lot of missing data, and in the in the data, database, the missing data was marked as minus nine nine nine. So we tried to fill in as much data as we could, you know, like damage notes, comments, ratings, width, lengths, etc. We re revisited every single one and tried to find information to fill the data. So here's kind of like the internal what the internal uh, national trade or database looks like. So this is 2019, 2020, and here are all the fields that goes into it. And here are the, you know, rating bases, comments, et cetera. So our results, uh, the 1980 to 2009 uh, National Toyota base, we added 128 additions, um, all F1s and F2s. And here I've kind of put the stats um, of what the old uh, stats look like and what the amended one look like. Um, so we can see that obviously F1s and F2s increased. Um, there's a number of significant tornadoes like F2 plus for the period. It now sits at 9.3% at of all tornadoes uh, after the amendment uh, before it was 8.7%. So 
So here's a few examples. We had, uh, obviously with all our QC, we found uh, we did bring a lot of event revisions. So uh, one of the bigger ones here was uh, the August 27, 1991 Quebec tornado outbreak. So we removed the Pierreville Quebec F3 and combined it with the Masquino G tornado um, after uh, further investigation of the event. We are also able to find um, Max with blank information for the Maskinology tornado. So we added all of that into the database. And the, uh, the event marked as Parc de la Mastigouche, Quebec, F2 tornado, uh, was renamed to Rizel Phonic Mastigouche. And satellite imagery enabled us to find the path length with uh, start course and lat longs. And uh, another revision was the Drummondville, Quebec tornado. Uh, it was upgraded from F1 to F2, and we found damage that was $43.6 million. So here's, here's uh, the Gazelle Fornic Mastigush tornado. And uh, this was recently discovered actually by me <laughs> on, uh, on satellite here. So with this, uh, this huge scar that we left in the forest allowed us to you know, update uh, you know, the path, and the, the width, and the start points and the end points. <laughs> And uh, we were able to, to add the TSDI, the tree DI, uh, to justify the F2 rating to it. So here's some stats on the old uh, 1980 to 2009 NTD versus the abandoned. Uh, so in the boxes here, you can see obviously the number of tornadoes increased overall, and then the mean also increased from 61 to uh, 66. So then for the 1991 to 2009, um, again, here are the stats so the amount of significant tornadoes f2 ef2 plus sits at about 10 percent of all tornadoes uh, which is roughly a one percent increase from the previous period um, a significant discovery for the period was the brooks lake ontario ef2 tornado uh, in 2020 so this was analyzed by ntp to be the widest canadian tornado on record so here's what the 1991 to 2020 um, map looks like all the points. So again, the, the, the annual average 62.3. And here's the 1980 to 2009 map. So the average is 65.6. Now, if we compare the two, here's a difference in tornado count uh, between the 1980, 2009 and the 1991, 2020. Uh, please note that the years, you know, 1991 to 2009, the 10 year uh, overlaps in the data. So really we're just comparing the first 10 years, uh, 1980 to 1990 versus the last 10 years, 2010 to 2020. But still the data shows a significant decrease of tornado counts, mainly over the prairie provinces. Uh, so this is something we didn't expect. Uh, we expected tornado counts to have increased with better technology, more interest and you know better reports uh, and projects like NTP, basically looking at everything. So if we compare the month, a uh, monthly comparison for between NTDs and each province, you can see a shift in tornado season, uh, kind of like what uh, Dave just talked about in his talk here, uh, but across Canada. So in 1980 to 2009, the season was mainly, mainly June and July. But what we're seeing now is a shift toward July and August. And the peak month for each province is still uh, July. And Ontario, uh, the red line in here, and then Quebec, the purple line, uh, both increase a lot by a lot. So then uh, we compared uh, the tornado intensity and first tornado days uh, for the 1980 to 2020 period. So the whole period, we wanted to see if there was a correlation between the two, and there isn't. So the leading theory, oh, sorry, the wrong slide here. So the leading theory here is that uh, with climate change, um, you know, you would, you would get less tornado days, but more intense tornado days, uh, i.e. like more than one tornado. Uh, however, the data in Canada doesn't reflect this at this time. So here are the conclusions. So overall, you know, tornado counts has decreased across Canada uh, over the last 30 years when compared to the previous period, mostly over the prairies, uh, we're expecting an increase in tornado counts, like I said, with better technology uh, detection plus NTP project. So possible cause, cause of this is uh, 
probably stricter criteria now for including an event as a tornado uh, than in the past. So this might might have inflated numbers in the past and the curve regions. So monthly data shows evidence of shift in tornado season toward the end uh, toward the end of the summer. Then Ontario now has the most uh, tornadoes in Canada versus Saskatchewan for in the previous period. And uh, so we're aiming to publish these results in the CMOS uh, atmosphere. The breaking up process. Okay, well, I'm basically done here. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out and you can reach out on social media as well. Okay, we really, we're having trouble hearing you, Francis. Maybe, maybe people can respond in the comment section or post questions there. If anyone has questions for you. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Okay, uh, does anyone have questions? For, oh, there you are, you're back. Okay, does anyone have questions for Francis? Uh, I, I see there is one question in the chat. Uh, you have seen, have you seen any air quality wildfire smoke relationship to tornado frequency and intensity? Yeah, this is, uh, can you hear me now, Julian? Yep. Yes. Um, thanks for your question. This is uh, actually something we're looking at, uh, especially last year with the um, huge wildfire season in BC. Um, so there is a there is a relationship there uh, where it basically suppressed uh, you know tornado activity in the prairies last year. So we're definitely one of the reasons why we're doing this database is to essentially try and answer questions like that. All right, good. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, interesting. And uh, you were way under time, so that's bought us some more time. Um, but Shunxi Wang uh, is next is going to speak about Canada's first and only F5 EF5 tornado observation and modeling analysis. All right. So uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. So, yep. Can everyone see it? Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All right. So, um, yeah. So, now, my name is Chang Chi Wang, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at, at the University of Manitoba working under the supervision of Jiang Hansak. So, today I'll talk about the observational and modeling analysis of Canada's only FI and EFI tornado. And I, I gave the same talk last year, but now we have some new results. So I just want to provide an update on that. So the Eli Manitoba tornado was a violent, narrow and slow moving tornado that occurred in early evening of June 22nd, 2007 and struck the western edge of Eli Manitoba as shown by this map on the upper right. And it destroyed a handful of houses and also filled up a few cars along its path, as demonstrated by the photo on the bottom right. And uh, it was rated F5 after all the damage surveys has been completed. And it remains as only, only F5 tornado within Canada, even to this day. Uh, a detailed analysis of this event has not yet formally been published in literature. That's why we, we want to um, that's why we want to study this event with, with the following three goals. The first goal is to characterize the synaptic and mesoscale environments and to identify the triggering mechanism. The second one is to compare this event with uh, two past significant tornado events in North America and to better understand Canadian tornado environments through the analysis of historical events. For today's talk, I will just focus on the first bullet point, which is to characterize the synaptic and mesoscale environments and identify the strong trigger mechanism. 
because there, there was no field campaign, so we mostly had to rely on the observational operational observational data sets. These include local airport and weather station observations, as shown in this map. And we also have the Woodlands Manitoba operational radar, which is located right here. And then we also have the visible satellite imagery that from GOST-12. And however, we do actually have two pieces of special observations. This include an 18Z sounding that was released from Winnipeg. And one of our co-authors, Justin, actually went on store chasing on that day. And he actually witnessed the tornado's entire life cycle. So I'll be showing some of the photos of the tornado that he took in a couple of slides. So here is just a, a mirror analysis that Justin conducted before he went on, went, went on strong chasing on that day, identifying a region favorable, favoring severe weather, severe weather over southern Manitoba. So here's a brief overview of the event. The first panel here shows the observed visible satellite imagery. The second panel here shows the radar reflectivity. And the third panel here shows the radial velocity. So the ELAS supercell initiated up to the south of Lake Manitoba around 22 UTC and initially propagated eastward and then turned south eastward as it intensified. And once it matured into a supercell, it, it featured a strong velocity couplet with a the gate to gate shear reaching around 35 meters per second. The tornado touched down around 2330 UTC and struck the town of Eli at 2350 UTC. So some of the photos that of the tornado that Justin took can be seen on the bottom. And after Seoul Seoul Sea on June 23rd, the storms in the area all transitioned into a mesoscale competitive system. So based on the radar imagery, it seems like the possible storm triggering mechanisms on this day include a, a couple of mesoscale boundaries to the south of Lake Manitoba. There a, was a lake breeze front along the southern shorelines of Lake Manitoba, horizontal contact with rose, and even some gravity waves propagating northeastward. To diagnose the last year fault pattern, we use the rapid update cycle analysis at 21C from this day. So the first panel here shows the 500 hyperscale absolute vorticity in field contours. The second panel here shows the 700 hyperscale relative humidity in field contours. The bottom two panels show the temperature and dew point at 850 hyperscale and at the surface, respectively. And for each level, the geopotential height or the pressure and the wind bumps are also overlaid. So overall, the, the day feature uh, consistent conditions in the upper levels in the afternoon after, after the passage of a mid-level trough in the morning. And at the low levels, uh, strong warm air, warm air and moisture, moist air infection was occurring by the south of, uh, 15 to 25 knots southwesterly winds. And in the day, along with the strong solar heating, the surface temperature over southern Manitoba in the late afternoon reached around 28 to 31 degrees Celsius. And that dew point reached around 18 to 22 degrees Celsius. And also towards the early evening hours, uh, early evening hours, there was a snuffly cold front approaching the area from the northwest. So the observed Winnipeg sounding also reveals um, a substantial amount of confederable available potential energy of around 1,000 joules per kilogram. But there was also a large amount of confederate inhibition reaching around more, more, reaching more than negative 150 joules per kilogram. The low level wind shear was around 25 knots and the deeper layer shear was around 40 knots. And the low level storm relativity was around 300 meters squares per second square. And based on this observed sounding, the supercell composite parameter calculator is around 5.7, which actually suggests a decently supportive environment for surface-based supercells. However, because of the still small mixed layer cape and also still the, the still large mixed layer sin, the, the significant total parameter calculated is zero. So obviously a strong supercell produced a violent tornado later in the afternoon. So the, the environment must have become more favorable for tornadic, tornadic supercells. So to better understand the, the mesoscale environment just before the Eli supercell initiation and to identify the strong trigger mechanisms, we will resort to numerical modeling. So a real case numerical simulation of this event is performed using the weather research and forecasting wolf model for version 4.2.1. And we use four nested domains as shown right here with the, the finest square resolution being 333 meters, focusing over the Southern Manitoba area. The simulation is initialized using the six hourly 12 kilometer North American mesoscale scale analysis. And at, it's initialized at 00C of June 22nd and integrated for 30 hours. And the model apply four model phases as shown right here. 
So let's look at how the simulation performed. The bottom two, the up, the up two, top two panels show the observed physical elementary and the radar activity. And the bottom two panels show the simulated cloud top temperature on the lower left and the simulated radioactivity at one kilometer above sea level on the lower right. The simulated object holistic contours are also overlaid in the lower right panel. So overall, the, the simulation seems, uh, seems to produce confession about a couple hours earlier compared to the observation, but the supercell development, maturation time, location, and track structure overall agree with the observation to a decent degree. And as in the observations, the simulated storms transition into a mesoscale computer system after COC on June 23rd. Although not shown, the sim simulated synoptic pattern also reasonably agree with the observations. The similar 18C sounding at Winnipeg also matches with the observed sounding in terms of temperature, dew point, and wind direction profiles. The simulation also, uh, the similar sounding also produces a decent amount of surface space conditional instability and also compatible inhibition, thus in observation. However, the simulation seems to underpredict the low level wind shears parameters, but it performs slightly better for the uh, deeper layer shears. Uh, proxy data sets such as the Rapid update cycle analysis also suggests that the low level wind shears was weakening throughout the afternoon on a day. So it might just be that our simulation was weakening the low level wind shears too fast. And overall, we believe that our simulation performed well enough uh, to capture the conditions on that day. So it can be used to answer the questions that we laid out above. To evaluate the supercell environment just before the supercell initiation, we compute the supercell composite parameter using the simulated fields. And the first panel of this figure shows the most unstable cape in field contours and the most unstable sin in the blue shaded contours. The second panel here shows the affected layer shear. The third panel here shows the affected storm elasticity. And the last panel here shows the, the supercell composite parameter calculated. And for all, in all panels, the simulated reflectivity at one kilometer are also overlaid. So as you can see by 20C in the afternoon, uh, the, the most unstable cape in the area has reached around 3,500 joules per kilogram with a nearly complete erosion of the capping inversion. However, there was still likely some mixed layer sin in the area. And the effective layer shear was, was around 30 to 35 knots and the effective storm velocity would reach around 50 to 100 knots. Uh, 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 50 to 100 meters square per second square. But both of these parameters suggest uh, discrete but non tornadic to weekly tornadic supercells. The supercell composite parameter calculated was around four to six, which is on the lower end of the typical range for surface space supercells, according to Thompson et al. 2012. To identify the storm triggering mechanisms, we look at the simulated average flow below two kilometers above sea level. This panel here shows the average vertical motion in field contours, the sea level pressures in black contours, the 10 meter wind streamlines, and also the simulated reflectivity at one kilometer of sea level. And according to this map, we have identified two lines of ascent to the south of Lake Manitoba that resemble the mesoscale boundaries that we saw in the observation just prior to the Eli supercell initiation. And it turns out that these two boundaries are likely a weak moisture gradients uh, according to the this map here showing the their average mixing ratio. And this moisture gradient can also be seen in the average cross section shown on the bottom the left, taking across this area here. So you can see this more quick moisture gradient boundary, boundary here, especially later on. And with the moisture air being denser than the drier in this case, um, a sense are produced when we have the westerly flow kind of overruns both of both of these boundaries. So in addition, horizontal combative rows and a couple of lead troughs paralleling the, the foothills of the Red River Valley are also simulated. So the vertical motion associated with the least lead troughs perturb the stable layer above the combative boundary layer, which produce wave-like motions that resemble the bending that we saw in the observation. So this, these features interact all together to produce the simulated Eli supercell. So I'll just repeat this um, animation one more time so you can see it. Maybe one more time. 
So after the similar Eli supercell initiated, it also modifies its local environment. So this figure shows the same field as before, but now the, the mixed layer cape and the significant tornado powder are also overlaid in the first and the last panel respectively. So as you can see, both the effective wind shear and the effective storm reference see a strong enhancements within the, the storm's path. And as a result, the supercell combustible priority within the storm's inflow region nearly doubled. Uh, it was four to, four to six before, now it's around eight to 12. However, for the significant tornado powder, we only saw a slight and brief enhancement. And this is probably due to the, uh, the mixed layer cape got, uh, gets uh, rapidly consumed by the simulated supercell and the mixed layer sim increases due to the weakening solar heating. So if the storm were able to ingest the still unstable air slightly to, uh, slightly to the southwest of the southwest of, right, southwest of it, then, then the, we believe that the storm, um, the significant tornado powder may be significantly enhanced. So in summary, um, a detailed observational and modeling analysis of the Eli Manitoba F5 tornado was conducted. The pre-storm environment featured low level warm air moisture air reflection during the daytime along with strong diurnal heating. The large point instability was present over the area just before storm initiation. However, the shear parameters were weaker than those typical for tornadic supercells. Uh, different mesoscale scale features, including moisture gradient boundaries, horizontal complex rows, lead troughs, and their induced gravity waves interacted to trigger the storm. And once the storm uh, initiated, it also likely modifies the environment in the path, leading to a more favorable uh, environment for strong supercells and potentially significant tornadoes. And uh, although we have identified a few possible triggering mechanisms for the Eli supercell, we are still kind of unsure about the exact nature of these boundaries. So that's why we, in the future, we plan to do a couple of sensitive, sensitive experiments to investigate the, the terrain effects on the lead, lead trough strength and also gravity waves. And also we, we want to um, understand whether the liquids had any effect on triggering the Eli supercell. So yeah, that's it for my presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Chen Xi. Uh, very interesting study. Uh, is, this looks like you're going to be writing a paper up on this at some point. Yeah, the paper is coming up soon. Been working on it for some time. So. <laughs> any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. What do you think the most valuable lesson learned was here? Um, I mean, did, did, did people wake up that morning thinking there might be an EF five? Is there I, anything I think, that? Yeah, I think there was just be needs to be more observations because well, the the observed something was taken at eighteen C, which is like probably four hours before the supercell initiation, and a lot of things could have changed within four hours. So I think it's important to actually have like real time, like the most up to date observations, so that people can actually forecasters can actually like make the most accurate forecast. No, I agree. We, we have a definite gap in observations over Canada. Yeah, um, especially soundings too. Yeah, especially in 2007. There's, there's not much area. All right. Well, if you do have any questions for Chanxi, please post them in the chat, and I'm sure we'll be happy to, to get back to you. Um, we've got one more talk left here this afternoon. So if you just give me a second. So the last talk today is going to be by Mustafa Kamal, and uh, he's going to be speaking to the exploration of the meteorological conditions associated with classic type supercell thunderstorms on the Canadian prairies. So this is something that a lot of us are very interested in, so I'm looking forward to see what you have to tell us, Mustafa. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Julian. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you uh, see my full screen? It's all good. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mm. My name is Mustafa Kamal, and I'm a PhD student in the School of Environment and Sustainability. And my PhD research is supervised by Professor Yan Bingli. 
Uh, so my talk uh, is uh, organized as follows, uh, background, objectives, data and methodology, results followed by a conclusion. So some uh, background. So as uh, you, uh, we know that a uh, classic supercell produces the most violent tornado on earth, uh, as far as we can remember uh, in the December, uh, the number of casualty make the interstate tornado uh, uh, in US, which killed around 100%, and it is resolved from a classic type supercell. And uh, study uh, indicate that a, a majority of the tornado in Canada, uh, specifically in the prairies, are produced by classic type supercell. And as you can see, uh, a paper, uh, I'm citing uh, uh, some uh, a figure from Professor David Steele uh, published in 2012. And you can see that uh, this is the observed uh, tornadoes uh, statistic from 1970 to 2009. Uh, so I think you can see from this figure that uh, uh, tornadoes are concentrated uh, mostly here. Uh, there's uh, southeastern uh, Saskatchewan and on southwestern uh, Manitoba. And so uh, the density, a tornado density is a little lower uh, in the Alberta. So uh, a, a study published by uh, 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 one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Lucia Schaubs, uh, uh, supervised by Professor Yan Ping Lee, found that uh, under future uh, climate condition uh, uh, in the Canadian prairies, uh, the frequency and magnitude of the dry line uh, may increase. And a uh, study showed that uh, dry land play a very important role uh, in uh, producing a classic type supercell uh, through explosive convection development. And um, last but not least, one of the uh, principal motivations that uh, in Canada, uh, there is a very limited uh, literature, uh, published literature about uh, a comprehensive understanding of the different type of supercell. So my study aims uh, to fill that gap. So as uh, another figure, you can see that uh, this is uh, the analogy, the physical mechanism, uh, uh, the classic type supercell uh, developed in the Great Plains. So my another objective is that uh, to see if uh, the same uh, physical mechanism applies uh, for the classic type supercell uh, over the Canadian prairies. So, uh, so now I have uh, two objectives. Uh, one, the first objective is uh, to identify the meteorological condition which developed, favored the development of the classic type supercell, uh, specifically uh, of the uh, uh, Saskatchewan and uh, Southwestern Manitoba. And uh, the second objective is uh, to quantify the dynamical and thermodynamical characteristics of the classic type supercell. Uh, so now uh, data and methodology. So unlike uh, other uh, studies, uh, I, I as you know, like uh, you have uh, seen over the last couple of days uh, that in, in the Canadian prairies, one of the uh, limitation uh, of studying supercell uh, or specific thunderstorm is uh, the data this, uh, uh, like a uh, deficiency. So as I just mentioned uh, uh, just in the last talk uh, that uh, we don't have any uh, sounding of the uh, very limited sounding observation. Unfortunately, there is no sounding observation uh, in Saskatchewan. So only two in uh, Alberta and then one, uh, I think two in uh, uh, Manitoba. So this is one of the biggest problem. Uh, so uh, that is why actually, so one of my uh, key, uh, like how I collect the data is, so mostly uh, is a, through crowdsourcing, uh, I would say. So primarily from a uh, storm theater. So I uh, particularly uh, develop a relationship with those storm tester and then I purchased those uh, storm tester with their database uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And so when uh, I came to know about the particular like, different type of supercell, all three different type of supercell, LP supercell, HP supercell, and the classic supercell. So, and then, uh, so this is, let's say, for example, this is uh, two cases, uh, uh, tornadic supercell that produce uh, three tornadoes each. Uh, one is, I think the left side is uh, to, uh, July 4, 2020, and the right side is uh, June 26, 2012, uh, both in South Saskatchewan. Uh, so then I, uh, with this information, I go back uh, to look at uh, in the radar reflectivity map. Uh, so either from the super res uh, resolution reflectivity from commercial uh, uh, provider or from the Environment Canada. 
So as you can see from the right panel, this is a uh, uh, schematic diagram of the classic type supercell. So there is a particular some feature here that uh, we know, uh, uh, hook echo so in the radar reflex imagery map and the trunking line convection here uh, in flow boundary layer. And then also that uh, clear diff uh, a, and uh, we say call it uh, eagle uh, shape uh, of the reflectivity map. So, and then again, so I uh, identified those uh, hook echo on the radar reflectivity map. And then, uh, so this is, uh, you can say that uh, this is the same two example. Uh, so here, the another uh, key characters I mentioned that uh, the this uh, supercell uh, should be the minimum uh, contamination from the neighboring cell. So as you can see that here in the right panel, this is a very discrete cell, uh, specifically the, it is one of the characteristic, the classic of supercell, uh, which uh, as, a, as, a develop, uh, as an independent uh, cell. Okay, uh, so right hand, it is again the, the two uh, supercell type. Uh, so you can clearly see that hook equal shape uh, from the radar rad reflectivity. And then I uh, also use uh, that uh, satellite imagery uh, to identify that, okay, the another characteristic uh, so for, uh, to figure out uh, whether there is a flanking line convection in the satellite imagery and as well as uh, the like, inflow, uh, uh, inflow uh, year and inflow tail. So uh, this is, I can see, uh, this is uh, from um, July 4th, 2020 uh, case. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so I, uh, for uh, to, Find uh, the triggering mechanism as uh, my uh, the previous uh, uh, like the presenter mentioned uh, that there are different uh, mechanism uh, that trigger specifically needed for triggered supercell uh, thunderstorms. So one of them is uh, the frontal uh, like we know we need uh, the moisture uh, uh, instability uh, and the triggering mechanism. Uh, so I think uh, uh, to find uh, the large scale uh, condition like specifically frontal detection, I uh, analyze the uh, weather prediction center subject chart analysis, and then uh, to find. Uh, uh, the vorticity ad uh, positive vorticity advection uh, and the uh, jet streams, uh, which uh, provide a large scale at the uh, mid level uh, at 500 supercell and up. Uh, so, here for the surface uh, chart analysis, and then I analyze uh, a recent product developed by the NOAA's uh, advected layer precipitator water, uh, which uh, helps uh, to find uh, that uh, elevated mid layer on uh, a continuous matter, uh, unless, like, unlike uh, the radio sun observation, which gives us the to check the uh, inversion layer only at two different times, 0 UTC and 12 UTC. But uh, this uh, product uh, gives us uh, to check it, uh, the advection of the elevated mix layer. And then uh, lastly, uh, I analyze the uh, sounding drive uh, parameter uh, to uh, characterize, uh, to find the characteristic values of the different thermodynamic and kinematic parameter. So as I mentioned that, okay, I uh, analyze uh, that uh, uh, weather prediction center, uh, sorry, weather prediction center surface analysis chart uh, to identify uh, the front, uh, like as you can send the cold front, warm form, and, uh, and the uh, dry layer. Uh, so specifically that uh, the classic type supercell uh, developed at the triple point, uh, uh, so intersection between this, uh, uh, the cold front, warm form, and the dry form uh, layer. And then, as I again mentioned, that, that I analyzed the upper air chart uh, to find that, okay, how much uh, boosting uh, this uh, upper uh, level, uh, like specifically jet stream. As you know, that uh, in the uh, jet stream, uh, the, uh, at the left exit region, uh, like upper level divergence, uh, provide a, 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 trigger, a lower level convergence and a continuous, uh, like a continuous uh, deep convection here. So, I, uh, this is also uh, crucial for uh, the positive vorticity advection. So this is, uh, I also, uh, that it is how uh, I uh, identified whether there is a larger scale uh, boosting for uh, triggering this uh, super, uh, classic uh, supercell. So now uh, you can see the figure uh, from the visible satellite imagery uh, from the year. And this is the first, uh, in the left case, uh, it is just in the last year uh, on uh, May, uh, June 15, uh, 2021. So here, as you can say that uh, over the subcartoon, uh, here uh, there is a, a sharp dry line. You, you see that the explosive development of the convection along the dry line here. And the same thing here in the right side here, uh, which is uh, here, you mentioned the, the July 5th, 2017 uh, on the border between um, Manitoba and that's one. And like as I mentioned, that elevated back layer, uh, which is uh, like uh, the elevated terrain of the Rocky Mountain, uh, provide uh, a, a dry, warm, uh, create a warm, dry air at the mid to upper level, and which is uh, we, uh, advocated uh, over the prairies and making it a warm air uh, uh, over uh, 
relatively like a warmer air, relatively uh, over uh, a warm air. So which is uh, like at the at specific in the morning, uh, it provides as a cap uh, preventing the early convection development. So, and then uh, thereby uh, uh, like uh, instability start keep growing. And once the cap broken at, at some, uh, at, the, at the late afternoon or the mid afternoon, and we see that explosive development as you just see in the previous figure. So as I mentioned that uh, I analyzed that advector level precipitable water uh, to identify whether uh, the, where this uh, the dry air is coming. So as you can see uh, at uh, this advector layer precipitable water gives the advection of the water at uh, four different layers. So surface to 850 hectopascal, 850 to 700, 700 to 500, and then 500 to here. So as you can see from this uh, particular case, uh, July 4th, and that the moisture is uh, transporting from uh, the northern Great Plain all the way to Canadian Prairies and here in the two quarter level. And at the same time, uh, at the mid level, uh, you can see uh, like upper level 300 feet and the dryer coming from uh, over the uh, Rocky Mountain all the way uh, to the Canadian Prairies. So, and lastly, like uh, uh, I analyzed uh, as I, uh, in my study, like until now, uh, I'm analyzing uh, 16 uh, classic type of supercell. And uh, so I analyzed the sampling parameter uh, to uh, characterize the thermodynamic and dynamical characteristics of these classic type supercell. So, okay, uh, so now I can, uh, I can see a comparison uh, between uh, different, uh, the, in the left panel is uh, that the surface base cap uh, and the most unstable cap. So I, uh, uh, although I analyzed uh, four, dip, uh, four different caps, but I'm showing the result from uh, only the surface base cap and the uh, most unstable cap. So here I find specifically like uh, the, all the 16 different cases I analyzed, uh, uh, the 13, dip, uh, 13 cases uh, we, we find uh, like the elevated mid layer. Uh, like, uh, so elevated mid layer is the most dominant factor uh, while uh, triggering the classic type supercell over the Canadian phrase. And here uh, you can see that uh, the uh, here the most unstable cap here uh, among the three uh, here like uh, although we say the cap values are relatively little high uh, for the HP supercell, but uh, later on uh, uh, in the right panel you can see here uh, that uh, the D cap uh, down drop cap uh, which is for the LP uh, so here uh, please uh, consider that LP stands for low precipitation supercell and the rate is uh, comparing the HP uh, high precipitation supercell and the green is comparing uh, the classic type supercell. So I analyze data from uh, like, uh, although I'm not showing in this uh, here in the presentation, but uh, I've been working for both, all three different types of supercell uh, under my PhD. So here on the right panel, you can see here that uh, the dynamic, uh, the down drop cap for the classic type supercell is the highest among the three different types of supercell. So this is, uh, this is uh, have a significance, uh, I'll uh, talk in the later on that how this, uh, uh, like a specifically down prop cap uh, is uh, distinguishing uh, the uh, amount of precipitation between uh, HP supercell and the uh, classic type supercell. Uh, in this panel, you can see here the uh, strong relative velocity. Uh, so uh, you can see here that again, a very important, uh, interesting thing here that uh, in the uh, uh, the left three in the left panel, and the first three uh, plot is showing uh, the strong relative velocity for the lower level, so surface to one kilometer, and the right three uh, panel is showing surface to uh, three kilometers. So it's a, a little uh, the deep layer shear, not deep layer shear, but uh, three. To, but I find that uh, deep layer shear from surface, like I mean. Uh, zero to six kilometer show less sensitivity among the three. But uh, I think I find the most significant uh, difference uh, on here at the, uh, like the characters, uh, the low level uh, stability uh, helicity uh, give the uh, distinguished uh, characteristic between the LP supercell, HP supercell and the classic type supercell here. And uh, here, uh, as it reflected here, the Baku in shear here, uh, I think uh, one of my, uh, I forget, uh, I think Danny uh, was showing when I, she was, uh, he was showing that uh, the hail uh, type, uh, he showed that, okay, that uh, the bulk wind difference, uh, the values. So here, interestingly here, uh, I can see here that uh, uh, in the Canadian period, like uh, I was, comp uh, I'm also comparing with the US uh, 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 counterpart. And I find that specifically in the Canadian period uh, that uh, the supercell uh, develop relatively lower uh, particle wind shear, uh, specifically bulk and the uh, strong relative helicity compared to their uh, yeah, northern plain, uh, great plain counterpart. Uh, I think uh, temperature lapse rate is one of the most important uh, uh, variable I find that uh, that uh, distinguish uh, between the HP supercell uh, and the uh, 
here, yeah, classic capsule for cell. And as you can see from here, that uh, temperature lapse rate at mid level, I think uh, 750 to, uh, you can see here, the first three, uh, but the uh, box and we support is showing uh, temperature lapse rate for 850, 500 to 800, sorry, 850 to 500 hectopixel, and then the right three is showing 700 to uh, 500. So here you can see again, at the mid level lapse rate uh, for among the three different types of super cell, uh, classic type super cell shows the most steep uh, mid level lapse rate. And this have an implication again. I mentioned that uh, this is one of the characteristic. It is uh, distinguishing the different the precipitation amount between the HP supercell and the classic test supercell. So when uh, there is a uh, strong uh, uh, like uh, this uh, mid level lapse rate, it is uh, making the very strong updraft and which is again uh, so the sending of those uh, like uh, hydrometeors uh, very high at atmosphere and then it keep going and then rotating. So there are multi multiple cycle. Uh, this uh, like the hydrometer is going multiple uh, cycles and which is uh, helping to grow the hail size. And this is how, why I think uh, we find that, uh, like um, our, my study find that specifically that the classic type supercell here producing one of the largest uh, like hail uh, among the three uh, here in the Canadian prairies. And one of the key factor is the steep lapse rate and which is resulting from the elevated nuclear of the Rocky Mountain. And the right side here again, I, I think I need two minutes more on it. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, here you can see the bulk uh, difference, and I think this is here important. Like although that uh, we have a similar kind of gap uh, between HP supercell and the classic type supercell, but uh, the shear uh, uh, in case of a classic type supercell is higher, and that is uh, which uh, determining uh, like uh, this uh, the differences here, uh, making a, a balance between the uh, instability and the shear. So here uh, again, a very uh, little uh, difference on the total precipitable water between these three different types. So here, uh, so now at the, as uh, the conclusion, uh, you can see here. Hmm. That uh, among uh, we can see that, that uh, there is a characteristic difference between all the three different types of supercell over the Canadian prairies. And as we can, yeah, uh, the, the classic type supercell, uh, which I think uh, one of the key uh, factor is the uh, mid-level temperature lapse rate, and that is determining the difference between the total precipitation from the classic type and HP supercell. And HP supercell uh, and nuclear play a very important role uh, over the Canadian prairies, and that is uh, uh, helping uh, the explosive development, and which is also this. Uh, Cap is maintaining uh, like a low level inflow from warm moisture flux from even northern Canadian plain, and which is uh, helping the deep convection and uh, like uh, upper level diversion and the surface conversion. So overall, uh, the dynamical and thermodynamical uh, parameter shows the characteristic difference among the LP, HP, and classic pest supercell over the Canadian prairies. And so significant of my study, uh, this study finding uh, will have uh, operational weather forecast is, and predicting more accurate uh, forecast uh, for uh, high impact weather, like a tornado, hail, and uh, wind. And I think uh, these uh, two pictures, as I mentioned, this uh, tornado happened uh, on uh, June 15 last year. And the left picture is taken by Professor David Till, uh, thanks uh, to him. And there are, I think, three tornado produce. And uh, this is the right pan uh, produce, I think, uh, this narrow miss uh, this uh, farmhouse as as you understand that uh, that uh, is specifically how important uh, to uh, provide a more accurate focus for this uh, this high impact uh, weather event and so the future work uh, I've been doing, uh, I'll be uh, comparing uh, my uh, stat com like this statistics with the US, uh, Northern Great Plain uh, to see that how these values is different uh, from their US counterparts. And these are the list of reference. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Mustafa. Uh, interesting talk. Uh, we're running a little short of time here. So I'll invite you to, there is one question in the, the comment section. So I'll invite you to engage that person and answer their question. Um, that brings the, us to the end of the session today. So I'd just like to thank everyone for making the effort to submit abstracts and uh, present talks and share their uh, findings with us today and everyone for attending. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll bring the session to an end and uh, wish you all a very good evening and good afternoon. Thank you.